Hello and welcome. We're very pleased to be able to make this presentation to you tonight. Um, and I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute um, on the Sage Han Field Station. Um, the, um, I want to tell you first a little bit about our Redbud chapter. Um, the Redbud chapter is one of 35 local chapters of the California Native Plant Society. California Native Plant Society has been in existence for over um, 60 years and is uh, dedicated to helping individuals in California explore, learn about, advocate for, and conserve California native plants. The Redbud chapter was founded about 30 years ago, and we, of course, have share those goals, but we are uh, dedicated to doing that within the counties of uh, Nevada and Placer in California. Our chapter, which now numbers well over 400 members, uh, has researched and written two field guides to the wildflowers, trees, and shrubs of our two counties. Um, and those two books together cover about 80, 800 of the almost 3,000 species in our two counties. We have a very diverse uh, array of plants, given that we go from sea level all the way up to the top of the Sierras and over to the Eastern Sierra. And uh, we're very pleased to have um, Farland Felix and Erica Kemmel tell us a little more about one of the very special places in the Sierras. Um, so what does Redbud do? We offer programs such as this one tonight. We offer field trips. We have plant sales um, one or two times a year. Um, we've recently, in fact, opened a propagation center. It's not a retail nursery, so it's not open to the public, but it is a place where we have members grow plants. And we now, right now, um, in preparation for our fall sale, which is coming up on October 1st, we have almost 1,200 plants growing that we will hope, hopefully sell. Um, to find out more about Redbud, um, and um, you can visit our Facebook page and our website. Those links are right now on the screen and um, they're gonna be put in the chat as well. We also have an Instagram and a YouTube account, YouTube account and our prior programs uh, of the past two years, as well as this program will be available on YouTube um, for you to enjoy. If you, so, we're lucky tonight to have, as I said, Farthen Felix and Erica Kim uh, talking about what I learned about plants after living at Sage Hen Creek Field Station for 20 years. Uh, uh, Farthen Felix um, is going to provide an introduction to conditions affecting botany in the Sage Hen Creek Basin and highlight some interesting lo local plants and ecological stories. Um, she lived on site and ser served as the assistant manager of the UC Berkeley Sage Hand Creek Field Station for 20 years. And um, in that process, she's created an, a huge array of terrific resources, um, primarily on iNaturalist, but also elsewhere with lists of plants and animals. Um, and birds and so on that are native to this area. Erica Krimmel is a digit digitization resources coordinator and biodiversity information scientist who works at um, who works with IDIG Bio and um, works with natural history collections the Natural History Collections community to maximize access to and usefulness of specimen-based based data. So with that, I turn it over to uh, uh, Farben and Erica. Thank you. Okay. Um... We got a screen. Let's see here, just a second. 
Uh, okay, there we go. There you are. Um, and play. Ah, geez, this is kind of annoying. The Sorry, I'm trying to get the screen to pop up, but uh, Keynote is blocking the button. You got any tips, Erica, here? Is Zoom hiding your button in Keynote? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Zoom is hiding the button. Yeah. You sorry, can click a little minimize. It didn't um, happen the last time, so. Or drag the videos to the far right, and they should shift. Oh, there it goes. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay, sorry. Fun on be, Zoom. Sorry to be a numb school. <laughs> okay. Are, are we good now? Okay, great. Um, all right, as everybody said, my name is Farthen Felix, and I retired right before Zoom became a really big thing, so uh, I'm kind of a numbskull, so sorry about that. Uh, uh, yeah, as, uh, <laughs> as uh, you heard, I'm going to talk about uh, botanical introduction to Sage and Creek Basin, and um, I'm uh, subtitling that, What I Learned About Plants While Living at, living at Sage for 19 Years. So this is the Sage Chen Basin. And I'll talk more about where that is, but you can kind of get a feel for how it sits up above the surrounding area and it's close to the crest, that's Castle Peak in the background. Um, you can also see out to the right side, of, right side of this picture up in the upper corner, there's a gap coming through the Sierra Crest. So that's important to the uh, water here. Um, with typical botany talks, you know, as with typical botany talks, I'm gonna talk about um, some wildflowers and specific plants, but we're also gonna talk about uh, bigger botanical issues, including regional spatial patterns and say trends controlling hydrology and geomorphology and philosophical explorations into um, wildfire and uh, forest policy, native plants and arts role in all of this. So uh, to paraphrase um, Betty Davis, fasten your seat belts is gonna be a wild ride. Okay. All right, so I, I should warn you, there are going to be some non-botanical asides um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, there are uh, plants that are influenced, plants are influenced by geology and hydrology and because plants are part of an ecological community. So, you know, it's hard to talk about plants without talking about that and hard to talk about a place without talking about that. So I'm going to go into that in quite some detail. Um, but first, I should really apologize, because if um, any of you have hung out with me, especially, you know, probably Erica, this applies to, or Brett Hall, I saw that Brett's in there, which is great. Um, you've probably heard all these stories before, so I apologize. <laughs> but uh, if not, um, then I hope you'll find something exciting and entertaining. So here's, a, here's basically an introduction to the area. We've got uh, I-80 passing across the crest of this era. The line that runs sort of north to south is um, the Pacific Crest Trail, and that does follow the crest quite closely. And this is uh, Sage Hen Creek. So you can see, again, it's offset from the crest, but that gap allows the weather patterns to come in from the west undisturbed. And um, so we get basically the same snow load as the crest up near the top, and it quickly attenuates off as the, the creek continues down towards the Great Basin. So it flows through the basin, ends up joining the Little Truckee River at what's now Stampede Reservoir, and then continues on. Um, other orientation is the, you know, Lake Tahoe is down here in the lower right corner. Um, let's talk about the human history of Sage Creek Basin just a little bit, okay? Uh, the Washoe were the Native Americans who lived in the basin for at least 13,000 years. They're famous for their basketry, fine, beautiful basket work made from willow, and the black stuff is bracken fern, actually. Um, so they would live there in the summer, and they would leave in the winter, and on the way out every year, they would light fires. So the fires would look like this. They're small. Look at the size of the trees. Look at the size of the flames. Look at kind of the air quality in this picture. There's smoke, but it's not that bad. And compare it to this, okay? This is the fire regime we have now. Look at the size of the trees, how close they are together. Look at the size of the flames. Because we're gonna get back to that. We're gonna talk about that quite a bit. Um, I will say that if you, you know, want more information about the Sage Hen Basin, we have a timeline and there's a link here on this page you can look at and, and revisit if, you, you know, if you're curious. So uh, things changed. Um, for the management of the basin when the gold rush happened. And after the gold rush happened, uh, people arrived um, and their interest in the forest was very different. They weren't managing for the commons. They weren't uh, uh, managing for you know, sustainability. They're interested in capital extraction and uh, had a very different perspective on private versus public land. So they, the clear cutting happened uh, fairly quickly. Um, these logs were taken out of the Sage Inn area. Uh, you can see how big they are, the big sugar pines. And you can see what they took. They only took the log. They left a bunch of stuff in the forest. 
including the tops and the little stuff and the sm trees that were too small. So after the loggers came through, then the cordwood cutters would come through and they would take what they could. And this is a pile of cordwood that's still in the Seijin Basin. It was cut in 1889 by Abner Weed before he headed off to found Weed California and become a, a, a politician in California politics, a big, you know, famous guy. And so this stuff is still sitting there and that tells you something about fire and I'm gonna talk more about that later. So uh, the uh, Forest Service eventually came in because first you've got the mining and then you've got the logging and then after the trees are gone, the, uh, the grazing happened. So it was, it, the, the land was getting devastated. So the Forest Service took over the basin in 1930, I'm sorry, the early 1930s. Um, and their, their mission has always been conservationist, not environmentalist. It's uh, to provide a constant stream of wood and water. So that's what they did. So the data collection in the basin started in the 1930s with the overflights for aerial photography by these DC-3s and snow surveys in the basin uh, to assess water supply. So uh, in 1949, the state legislator decided, legislature decided that there needed to be a fisheries and wildlife pro program at Berkeley, which was the only University of California campus at the time. So they went to Berkeley and said, hey, you should do this, here's some money. And Berkeley said, great. So they hired Doc Needham, PR Needham from uh, Oregon, who's a benthic macroinvertebrate specialist, the guy on skis here, which means he's a fisheries guy. And Starker Leopold, who was the son of Aldo Leopold, who was hugely influential in conservationist movement. And Starker was the, a very influential guy in his own account. So these were the two wildlife professors who started Sachin Creek Field Station after they hunted and fished their way through the Sierras and found a place that had water running all the time. Uh, so they skied out in the winter of 51 and signed the deal with some Forest Service people and some university people. So Sei Chen is now currently 22 little buildings in the forest, including our most famous building, which is a fish house. It's got eight, you know, or three eight foot glass windows in the creek so you can do observational studies of fish. Um, the other buildings are just little tiny cabins and things. It's on a, about a 350 acre footprint for the original uh, permit area, but the, the, uh, the place has since expanded to the entire basin in the formation of the Sage and Experimental Forest in 2005, and I'll talk a little more about that later. Okay, we're back to this picture. Um, Sage is actually part of um, a larger research consortium. Um, protected properties provide a unique research opportunity on a trans Sierra uh, transect that's a bit offset. So one of those is the North or the head, sorry, the headwaters of the North Fork of the American River. And then that little dot in the middle is the Central Sierra Snow Lab. So what are they like? Well, okay. Um, this consortium is called the Central Sierra Field Research Stations. There's a link here if you want to look up more information about that. Um, but the North Fork of the American River is on the West Slope. It's a, a group of properties that are both public and private. It includes the Onion Creek Experimental Forest, uh, Associated Forest Lands. There's the Chickering American River Reserve and the North Fork Association properties, which are private. So the basin is tricky to access. It's, uh, there is a public road, the Forest Hill Road, but the land on the other side is not public. So that's a challenge. Um, the best way to visit this place is to go to the top of Palisades Tram and hike in down the Painted Rock Trail. Um, and why would you want to do that? Because it's a beautiful place. It was never clear cut and uh, it was never grazed hard. So it has intact meadow systems. Since it's on the West Slope, it's more diverse botanically. It's really actually a very beautiful place. Um, the big trees are usually California incense cedar, but the North Fork also has the, the state's northernmost stand of giant sequoias. So that's interesting because they were planted by Native Americans, most likely. And it brings up a sort of an interesting question, doesn't it? A, a, a philosophical question about what really it means to call something a native plant, given that people like the Washoe and the, the Native Americans who were, you know, on the West Slope, various tribes, um, have been there for tens of thousands of years, selecting and influencing the species palette in large and small ways. So think about that and we'll return to that idea later. So uh, the other research property is the Central Sierra Snow Lab, as I mentioned, there's a link there if you wanna look into that. This is the longest weather and snow data set in the Western US, 150 years. It was started by the railroad, it used to pass over that pass and now passes through a tunnel. But the area receives massive snow loads. So it routinely exceeds 98 inches or 250 centimeters of maximum depth on the ground and 375 inches or 1,000 centimeters of total snow. 
But the problem is that the Sierras are actually really quite warm, and so they stay very close to freezing. That means that it uh, doesn't take much climate change to cause problems. So what's happening now, in about the last five years, snow is converting to rain. So the lab is receiving more of their annual moisture as rain than snow for the first time ever recorded. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that we lose our reservoir. So snow holds water and releases it slowly late into the summer and fall, and plants are adapted to uh, to require that. So some of those, you know, some of those things that to, some of those plants that are specifically targeted for this snow release melt are, are starting to respond really dramatically. And red fir in particular is running uphill. Um, so the other thing that's happening is fire is intensifying. And that's not a simple story, and we'll return to that one later. But the picture is of the Culture of Fire art project at Sachin that addresses these issues by creating this fairy tale that's uh, kind of delightful about fire sprites, which are forest spirits that are trapped in the woody debris and need fire to release them. So um, this idea allows people to escape this narrative of dread and fear and you know awfulness around wildfire. Instead, they can engage with the fire in a hopeful, fun way by creating their own sprites out of out of woody debris from the forest and return to be burned in prescribed fire. So it's one of many thoughtful, informed, and ecology related art projects at Sage Inn. So you might want to, I mean, that might make you ask, why would a field research station even want an art program? So uh, the creation of the Sage Inn Experimental Forest in 2005 that I told you about changed the management authority for the basin to prioritize research rather than multiple use, which means we don't have to worry so much about a strip mine being put in or another clear cut or, you know, a grazing permit being issued because research is now the highest priority in the basin. You can still visit it. It doesn't affect that at all. Um, so we thought this was going to be a really big thing. You know, we thought people would be really delighted that we've secured this, this 70 plus years of, of research and data collection in the basin, you know, mostly targeted towards issues that are really critical for them. I mean, these, the biggest socio-environmental disaster local folks are ever going to likely be enduring is fire, fire. And we were, you know, securing our research into that. And they just really couldn't care less. We found out that people just don't care that much about science. And it was sort of a shock to us. But why is that a problem? Well, here, this is a model borrowed from business theory, but it talks about what it takes to get to cultural change. And I don't need to tell you, we've got some pretty big, very real socio-ecological issues these days that we need to deal with by changing the way we operate. So if you wanna change culture, this is, the, this is how it happens. First, you collect data. So science and field stations are great at this. We're the champs, so we're good at collecting data. And second, you take that data and you turn it into some kind of knowledge. And you have to kind of figure out what it means, right? Then there's another step that needs to happen before you can get to policy and then to actual action on the ground where you're changing things. And that step is where we're falling down. This is where science can't get through. And this is where you make an emotional, empathic connection to the work that you're doing so that people care. Because when you get to policy, everybody has to care about it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So um, science just doesn't do that. It does the process of science is designed to strip your preferences out of it, right? It's just, you can't really have emotion in science in your scientific results, or it's not science. So that is alienating. But artists trade in emotion. So we started an art program in association with the Nevada Museum of uh, uh, the of Art Center for Art and Environment in uh, in Reno, and which is a very, very cutting edge museum as the only permanent uh, department like that in the, in the world actually so they hired in uh, 2011 i believe the harrisons helen and newton harrison to do a 50-year art project about uh, climate change and its effect on the sierras so these two people are were i'm sorry helen has passed on but uh, were the top environmental artists on the planet and their work leads to major changes like uh, the country of netherlands rezoning its entire country based on a project they did about the, this green heart in the country so big heavy hitters since then, we've done a lot of other work. Uh, you know, the the uh, Harrison project. Actually, Brett Hall is the uh, the botanist for that project, so you can you could always ask him more about it. But it, it's sort of conceptual, and the art actually emerges in gallery exhibits and museum things, not really the on the ground plots that you know have little plants and that is basically an assistive migration experiment to see how things will change over the next fifty years. So people were confused about it. It's like, well, why isn't yes, why is that an art project? So we went looking for more accessible stuff. We found this uh, visible barn, which is a, was a great project. It's this beautiful thing. It looks like it was designed to be at Sage Inn. It looks like one of our cabins. But when we announced it, people got upset and said, oh, birds are going to slam into it. Wildlife's going to slam into it. And this was fantastic. I mean, we did do some research and we built it with alumni's mylar, which reflects UV in the bands that 
that birds can see so that they, you know, presumably don't run into it. But uh, the point is that, you know, we have um, glass, we have windows in buildings at Sage, and we have roads, we have buildings, we have other structures in the forest, and nobody ever questions that. But because it's art, it makes you think differently. And it's kind of a lens for thought, a magnifying glass for thought. So um, that's exactly what we wanted to do. We want people to be asking these questions about everything we do. You know, why are we doing this? Is there a better way? And what are we trying to accomplish? So lots of other projects, a Native American artist, Nate Rifke, did these beautiful little interventions in the landscape. They're kind of a, a metaphor for the scientific process. You stumble on these things in the forest. Uh, Sonia Henriksen's snowshoe art. Bar Barbara Foster did a great project. Some of the surface wood that needs to come out of the forest, she strapped it to her feet and marched around and made wood prints out of it. So it's sort of a record of presence in the landscape. But the most Im important artwork that's come out of Seichen is this exhibit that's currently going on at um, the Truckee Rec Center. It'll run through the end of September, I believe. It's open every day. Some days it closes at noon, so check the website, but it's free. And this exhibit is incredible. It includes, you know, Oh, let's see, 19 artists, I believe, 11 of whom were Seijin artists and residents who were, you know, up to date on the science and on the policy issues, and then they addressed it in their work. And so this uh, exhibit by Michael and Heather Llewellyn takes you through the forest history, what the forest was, what happened to it, what it's become, and what it can be in the future. And it's, it's really powerful and, and really great. So I highly recommend you get up there to take a look at it. And there is a website here you can check as well as the website for the Sage and Art program if you're curious about that. So okay let's back to the big, big picture of, of Sage and Botany. And, uh, okay we are part of the Truckee River system, Sage Hen, um, which starts up here at the Sierra Crest you can see in the diagram then runs down into Lake Tahoe then out into the Truckee River on through Reno and out to Pyramid Lake. So it's an endorheic uh, river system which means it's closed basin and it doesn't flow to the sea. Uh, and, you know, it's, you really couldn't get more diverse landscapes, really. If you look at this, here's a picture here from the top of Sachin Basin, which is the near alpine zone. And uh, at the bottom, you know, after the mixed east side pine, you've got the Great Basin Desert. I mean, this is, uh, this is a huge change. Um, and of course, the iconic plant of the Great Basin is sagebrush, right? Well, there, uh, actually, here's a little picture of where Sage Hen is. So uh, there's been an ongoing research project about sagebrush going on at Sage Hen since, uh, oh man, for probably 25 years. So some of Sage Hen's most brilliant, longest running, most productive biological research. So um, that's what turns out to be about is plant communication. So that smell of sagebrush is lovely, but it's not for us. Um, we're eavesdropping on conversation. So Rick Carbon, um, his work was really controversial. He had to repeat his experiments like five times when he started because people just did not want to believe what he was telling them that, which is, you know, that, I don't know, people just always want humans to be special and it's hard to accept that even plants do sophisticated things. Um, so his findings are, here's Rick actually, his findings are kind of that plants are not helpless victims of their environment, as we tend to think. They uh, share information about herbivory with their neighbors and seeds using airborne chemical signals. Um, the neighbors and seeds respond by changing their chemistry to be less tasty or to delay sprouting. And then the most interesting thing is that the plants are actually kin selecting. So they are relaying information preferentially to their relatives, so which is increasing their fitness. So this is pretty incredible stuff. There's an article from uh, the New Yorker magazine that you can take a look at if you're curious about sort of an overview. But since then, Rick has written the, uh, the, the definitive work on plant communications. If you really want to geek out, you can look that up. Um, so, you know, this isn't the only scandalous plant behavior in the basin, actually. So there are other scandalous uh, plant and, you know, non-animal things going on in the basin. Um, slime molds, for instance, up there in the upper left corner are pretty fascinating. Single-celled creatures that get together to hunt or to grow these fruiting bodies to reproduce or to solve problems, and we can find their way through, through a maze. Um, and uh, you know, information processing without a brain is kind of mind bending. One of Sajan's artists, Jonathan Keats, actually uses slide molds to address questions like about immigration policy and transportation design. It's really funny work. And then he writes these goofy letters to senators. <laughs> it works awesome. Uh, other scandalous behavior, this equicetum, you know, up here is, a, is interesting. Alternating generations is a fascinating thing, I think, where it's sort of like a human gives birth to a cheetah and then the cheetah gives birth to another human. So in this picture, you've got the, the little pale sporophyte generation and then the bottle brush uh, gam gametophyte generation. 
And um, some things actually generate more than two gen or have more than two generations in their reproductive cycle, like these rust spores on the creek at Sage Hang Creek. This is up to five generations and um, two or more plant hosts. So pretty incredible stuff. Um, the lower left corner, let's see, this is um, evening, uh, diffuse flower evening primrose. And what it does is can, really, it's a control freak. It, uh, it opens up in the late afternoons, early evenings when all the other plants are closing up. So it's pollinated by vespertine specialists, um, specialist bees, usually a single species. But it also controls um, it does portion control on its pollen. So it doesn't want these bees pigging out on, on its pollen. It wants them to go further. So it controls it by with these viscan threads that most insects can't really can't really deal with. So that's pretty interesting. And rapid plant movement. There's several examples of rapid plant movement. And we tend to think of these plants as being sessile, but they're not. Some of them move and move very fast. So this is uh, this is a lupin, lupin angusta floria. It's uh, found at the upper part of the basin. You see how the pods twist. So as they dry, they twist, and when they split apart, they fling seeds up to uh, a meter away to spread the plants more e effectively. And the same thing happens with dwarf mistletoes, but they use thermogenesis. So their seeds heat up until the, they explode and fling these sticky little seed, their seed pods, and they explode and fling their sticky little gooey seeds onto the next trees where they can continue their life. But maybe one of my favorite plants in Sage and Basin is uh, Comitomonas nivalis, this watermelon snow, this plant that makes watermelon snow. So it, uh, it sits around as a resting spore on the ground until it snows and it still sits there. And then in the spring, when the snow starts to warm up and it becomes isothermal and the water starts to percolate through, um, they wake up, uh, they grow an eye and a tail, which freaks me out, and they swim to the surface and they sometimes will fuse as gametes, you know, on the way up, acting as gametes on the way up, but sometimes not. When they get to the surface, they start producing this incredible red um, pigment to protect themselves from the intense UV rays on the surface of the snow. But this stuff forms the base of the aeolian food chain up on the snow pack. So there's this entire little world that's going on there, including, you know, it, nutrients that are blown in by the wind and then, um, Animals that get gradually larger and larger, like these little springtails that show up in your steps in this, you know, when you're tromping around in the snow in the spring, and then on up to uh, stoneflies, winter stoneflies, and birds, and interesting how it all works. All right, uh, let's see. But okay, this is probably my favorite, and this is probably the most shocking plant behavior at Sage Hen, in my opinion. You may disagree. So dandelions are really the most familiar plant that there is, if you really want to get down to it, I think. And yet we really don't pay as close attention as we should. And it's an interesting thought because as we're going out and, you know, pulling grass to get a better picture of the photo of a, of a flower or, you know, bending things out of the way, we might want to think a little more carefully about what's really going on there because we may be concealing interesting behaviors, plant behaviors and associations. So, um, one thing about dandelions that I noticed is that they're kind of messy. They're just sloppy looking plants. And when you look at the old natural history prints, they never draw them that way. They try to draw an idealized perfect dandelion. And so they stand everything back up and then they do their drawing and make it look like a nicer plant than it is. But that's actually a problem because here's a picture I took of a dandelion at Sage Hen. And if you look at it closely, you can see that this plant is actually doing some really fascinating stuff. So the plant is only ever standing upright twice. And it's first when it forms a bud and shoots straight up and opens up like the little yellow flower and waits for pollinators, right? You wanna be high so the pollinators can find you. Then once you're pollinated, you don't wanna stay up there because you'll get browsed off by deer or rabbits or things. So what you wanna do is close up and drop down into the grass. So there's this curve and all of these little pollinated uh, flowers are dropping down into the grass. You can see, so there's that curve. But once you get way down in the grass like that, you can see at the bottom of the picture, way down in the grass, you don't want to leave your heads on the ground or the seeds will get eaten by slugs or they'll get moldy. So you bend them up a little bit. So you've got this cool little S-shaped shaped curve. And you can see that sometimes in the drawings over there, they'll use the S-shaped curve, but they put it in the wrong place. I mean, it's either on the upright flower, or it's, you know, it's on a, it, it's, it's never on something laying down because they haven't drawn that. Anyway, so you sit down there and you let your seeds get ripe. And then when they're, they're ripe, you can see this, this one little, flower head that has a little white tuft poking out, it's on its way up. It's been hiding down in the grass. Now it's going to stand up as tall as it can and open up so the breeze will take those seeds and spread them away. So that I think is fantastic. All right, so here's Sage Hen Basin. This is an interesting photo. Um, 
Let's see. This is how we're going to start with this case. So as you look at Sachem Basin on the left, you see Independence Lake. And on the right, you see Carpenter Valley, which is Prosser Creek. And those are two glacially carved valleys. So you can see that Sachem sits up, up top above. For, for whatever reason, it didn't glaciate to the same degree. So it's still volcanic. These others are largely granite. So you can see the exposed granite on the, uh, you know, basically the Sierra Crest that we're hovering above. And that's Paradise Lake on the right and Warner Lake at the very bottom there. And that, that little tiny pond dead center in the, the, the photo, you should keep that, you know, keep that in mind. So I'm gonna talk about that a little more, but Mount Lola's out to the left. And uh, um, let's see, what this is, is, um, yeah, okay, so Sachin is a nunatak. I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but what it is is a glacial oasis. So for 3.6 million years, including the Pleistocene maximum, Sachin was above the ice. So everything else got scraped away. And this process in some places led to giant placer gold deposits. I don't think that happened at Sachin, but uh, it's, um, it's been sitting there. And, and the thing that's really baffling about this is uh, that, uh, Mountains are just not stable landscapes. They don't do that. They don't hang around for millions of years. So we had some work done, um, Art Sylvester and, at UCSB and his students, and then some folks at USGS and the University of Nevada mapped the surface geology of Seichuan Creek. And they, um, they did some, some rock dating also. And they found that it's actually older than that. It's 5 million years old. So the age of this basin actually has some interesting consequences. And two of them I'll talk about are protocarnivory and um, clay layers. So I'll get to that, but let's finish up with the uh, hydrology for, uh, before we move on. So, so Seichen is volcanic. So and this is what it looks like. So you can walk around Seichen, you can find this stuff. And it looks like this all the way down. So we built some holes for uh, hydrology work and it just never changes. We were trying to get to bedrock and this is what it is. It's just shattered all the way down to where you hit that bedrock granite. So um, these little crevices hold water. So volcanics act like a sponge. They hold water in and then release it slowly. Whereas um, when you're in a granite basin, as soon as the snow stops melting, there's no more water and those things dry up. So that's clearly why there's a field station at Seichem. They needed year round water. Uh, let's see. So it also leads to some interesting phenomena like uh, the fact that when a raindrop falls in the basin, it takes 40 years to find its way to the Seichem tap. So sometimes we'll uh, bottle that water and label it for events. The CHF Reserve, 1978. So this is Independence and you see the creek coming in. And this is critical to uh, the spawning of the endangered Lahont cutthroat trout. So here in Independence Lake, just over the, the ridge is the last self-reproducing population of these trout in the world. Well, uh, not now. Pyramid Lake has a recovery program and they have some down there too, but that's a very recent thing. Anyway, um, the problem is that Remember, I told you this is scraped off the granite, so how does it have enough water? So the, the water is actually moving between these basins. It's really interesting. So water is seeping out of volcanic cessation and feeding the, uh, the creek so that the fish can swim up here and spawn in the springtime, keeping, you know, keeping up water in there to allow that to happen, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about that? Oh yeah, weirdly, it's not a one-way gift, but it's interesting because there's a line of springs in Seichen right at the level of the lake. And this is the, what feeds the rich sage and meadows in the upper basin. So it's, um, if you want to learn more about fish, there's a, a, you know, a little link right here you can, you can look into. Um, actually, let's go back. Yeah, so this water seeps back into sage and so it's going sideways. You know, it's, it's going under the creek. And then there's another row of, of springs on the Carpenter Valley that looks like the water is seeping out of sage and feeding the, the meadow systems there. So when you're talking about meadow restoration things, it's interesting. You're going to have to start thinking about where this water really comes from. It's not coming down the creek. It's coming from these other basins. And so this is suggested, but you can't really say for sure that that's that, the, where the water is coming from. So we're looking at a research project that would use a tracer to find that find that out. And you can't really um, use an isotopic tracer because they're so close together. The precipitation patterns just aren't that different. So the one thing that is different is what? What did I just tell you about? The fish, right? So we're going to try to use DNA to track that groundwater to see if it's the same water, map that groundwater and see if it's the same water that's moving through. So Jim Kirshner, our faculty emeritus, is looking at that. All right. So, oh, oops, I got the little fish back. 
Um, all right, so geological activity isn't the only source of mineral depositions that plants rely on. Um, for instance, uh, much of the banded iron ore deposits that we're currently mining are, were deposited by bacteria, as was the bog iron that the Vikings used and the early you know, European American settlers who uh, used it to make the cannons for the Revolutionary War. It's bizarre to think about renewable ore, but you can peel back the peat and harvest the uh, iron peas of a productive bog once a generation. So it's happening at Sage Gen 2. I don't know if you've ever seen this slimy red stuff that grows in, you know, in the meadows sometimes. What it is, is it's, uh, uh, it's an extremely foul bacteria, actually. Um, iron rich water is deoxygenated um, by microbial activity in the swamp. And so when it rises back up to the surface, it finds this bacteria sitting in the way, and this is the gatekeeper. So the bacteria uses the oxidation of that iron as soon as it's the air rusts and the bacteria grab that little electron and use that as their energy supply. And so this, this process is going on at the bottom of the sea in the, you know, these uh, thermal vents where there's never any sunlight. So this is a really strange form of, of uh, autotrophy, right? Um, most, of, most, most of this kind of productivity is caused by uh, photosynthesis. All right, so sometimes they produce this oil too, this oily looking stuff. Maybe you've seen that in the meadows and you think, oh God, petroleum pollution. But if you touch it, it shatters. It's actually a gelatinous thing that's formed by methane production. So it's, a, it's not oil, it's actually this bacteria. So there are a lot of other biological ores. And some of these, <laughs> these stories are just unbelievable. Believable. I mean, just mind boggling. So uh, there are biologically deposited ores for um, all kinds of things, uh, uranium, vanadium, gold. Uh, maybe magnetite is kind of one of the more interesting ones. It's thought that most, basically all the magnetite on the planet was formed in bird brains. And we thought that birds were using it to, uh, you know, to navigate with, and some do, pigeons will do that, they have a little compass in their nose, but most birds are actually using quantum physics to navigate. So at the end, I'm gonna give you a link and you can go back and you can look up some of these um, stories if you're interested, because, you know, we could just stay on this slide all day long. All right, so um, the sage and Vulcan has created the episodic blockages that form these water bodies um, that are very similar to Independence and Donner Lake, the way they look today, the same kind of size. And eventually, um, you know, the Erosion broke down the lake and it returned to being a creek. But uh, what it did was, um, you know, blocking the, uh, the basin like that it led to accumulations of clay and it led to uh, wave action created terraces. So if you drive into Sachin Creek, you'll be driving along a terrace that was actually created by, by waves. It's a lake terrace and it was later used for a railroad um, in the logging era. Uh, but the clay here is now exposed by downcutting in the creek. Okay, so this clay because Sachin didn't, uh, didn't glaciate, is um, a climate record. It contains a paleo climate record that predates the ice age. This is just incredibly rare, but the plant materials that are trapped in this clay, the pollen and the little bits of plant material can tell us something about you know, the paleo climate. So, so far we haven't had anybody to do any extensive work on that, but I hope that uh, someday we will because this is a fascinating story. But that clay also holds the water close to the surface. So that's why we can have this perennial creek and fens. So Sage Basin is the most fen rich, um, most has the highest concentration of fens in California. So fens are, if you don't know, are, are essentially bogs on a slope. So the water's running through all the time. Um, what that means is that they don't have sphagnum mosses because they're not strongly acidic. So the peatlands are pre pretty much um, neutral and pH and very cold. Um, it's derived from partial composition of two mosses, the Dripanocladus aduncus and Cratineuron felis, and then the uh, peat layers, and you know other herbaceous vegetation. So if you're interested in this, there is a you know a, a paper that here that you can download that's really interesting. Talks more about these fens written by Sage and researchers. But there is one really interesting story. So these fens just sort of breathe. The edges of these fens breathe. If it's a dry year, the lodge poles kind of crowd in. And then if it's a wet year, they get drowned out and they die like these you know, here in this picture. But we had some students at the station, they did an interesting project. We cut some of these little bushes, you know, bushy trees down and aged them. And it turns out that some of these lodgepoles are like 50 years old. So it's that tenuous. They're just kind of struggling to get by and, and survive and you know, grow. 
All right, so there are plants, aquatic plants, uh, because of all this water, some are really interesting. Um, this top left is uh, actually a cyanobacteria. It's Nostoc parmelioides, and it's a, it's sometimes called, Nostoc is sometimes called star jelly because uh, <laughs> it's an interesting way of looking at things. But Victorians would go out in the meadows to look at meteor showers, and they would find this stuff out in the meadows. So they thought that it was coming in on meteors. Um, this creepy, kind of creepy ideas led to a bunch of science fiction tropes like the blob and the body snatchers and, and really paranoid, really interesting stuff. But anyway, with Nostoc, these little ears grow when a little Cricotopus midge gets involved. So this little, having this little midge there triggers these, this uh, cyanobacteria to create these ears, which also benefits the Nostoc by creating more photosynthetic um, space. But then the, the little midge can live inside it and it's protecting the little patches. So. It's a good uh, indicator of good water quality. Um, there's also liverworts. Uh, some of the first plants that crawled out of the seed, but when they did, fungus was already here. So those fungal plant associations are very, very old. Uh, they're vascular plants, so you only ever see them, or the non-vascular plants, so you only ever see them right through the water because they, you know, they, they have to rely on osmosis. Uh, the center here is lemna, it's uh, duckweed. And that's a really cool plant. It's the smallest, that family is the smallest, uh, uh, flowering plants in the world has some of them. You know, some of them are larger, actually, some of the largest plants in the world too. That's an interesting thought. I hadn't you know, noticed that before. But these plants actually produce heat in their spadix. Um, and in some cases, it can be a lot. I and mean, some of the tropical plants are more metabolically active than hummingbirds when they're in flower. And they, uh, they have a fat burning pathway, which is just bizarre. Um, most plants just don't need that kind of energy. So, you know, maybe these little duckweeds are keeping the water from freezing it, you know, to extend their life, life span. Who knows? It's an interesting thought. And then on the right, this is interesting. This stuff that grows all over the fish house windows and rocks and everywhere else has an interesting name in German. It's called Alfbuchs, and it's a community of uh, plants, you know, a lot of algae. And uh, these guys, water bears, tardigrades, which are incredible, the only thing that survived five different extinction events. Um, you can strap it to the outside of a spaceship and it'll be just fine when it gets back. But also diatoms, plants made of glass. So these are um, marine diatoms. I, couldn't, I didn't have any pictures, so I covered more off the internet. And the, the ocean ones are prettier than the freshwater ones. But they're still pretty interesting and plants made mostly of glass. And they're really funny. Um, you know, they're, they're made of two valves, sort of like nesting petri dishes, and they reproduce by splitting apart and regrowing the smaller inside valves. So you can see that they tend to get smaller and smaller smaller over time until they finally have to have sex to reset the whole process. So that's pretty funny. Uh, the, met, the fan also encourages carnivory because, you know, the water is constantly running through, so it's stripping away nutrients. It's cold, so it's reducing, uh, you know, decay and, and uh, the recycling of nutrients. So they tend to have to catch bugs to feed themselves. So we have two species of Drosera, the sundews. We've got a species of Eutricularia. Um, they're not the only carnivores in the basin. Um, we have uh, a, you know, the carnivorous mushroom, which was a little mind boggling to me. I think mushrooms are a little scary, but the Coprinus comatus is a, an inky cap, self-digest, uh, you know, auto-digester that uh, also catches and eats nematodes. Um, other rare plants, that listed plants, we have 15 plants that are listed by Calphora, um, including, sorry, uh, let's see, Primus ibesia and uh, oh, this, uh, Ariophorum grassley. Most of our rare nature plants are related to the wetlands in California. Um, also, this carnivorous plant here on the lower right is uh, Trilea. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, Triantha, Triantha occidentalis, which is a recently described carnivore. So that's pretty cool. So I mentioned the utricularia. We have the utricularia minor, and it's an interesting plant. It's so primitive, most of it, but the actual traps are some of the most sophisticated structures in the plant kingdom and some of the fastest plant motion in the plant kingdom. And I recently learned that utricularia, you know, I don't know, some of these botanists were really, just really overeducated and smart, but the utricularia were the, uh, the utricularia were the boatmen on the Durance River in southern France. And they, you know, it's a wide river and flows huge sometimes and the rest of the time it's really swampy. So they had to build these rafts with goat bladders. So that's why they call it that. But that brings up a point that botanical names have a lot of really great stories. And two of my favorites are Wislesnius and uh, Greg, Josiah Greg and uh, Friedrich Wislesnius. 
So they knew each other and they, they've both written books and I highly recommend that you read them. They're, they're amazing, um, really exciting. But what they really point out is that, uh, you know, we, when we learn history, it's usually the, um, the history of the military. And if you really start looking into it, usually the botanists are there first. I mean, they're the ones doing the discovery. The military just comes along later when they find out that there's something worth, uh, you know, worth stealing. But <laughs> anyway, I also learned about another one recently, Sarah Plummer Lemon. There's a new book out about her. And yeah, I really recommend it. So anyway, Liz Lesnes, you know, ran off on a self-funded expedition. Josiah Gregg was running the wagon trains across the country and they, they kind of crossed paths. And uh, I don't know, Gregg was making discoveries on the battlefield of Buena Vista. It's, it's really cool. So. All right, so proto-carnivory, okay, Carn carnivorous plants. That's, uh, you know, it's pretty clear a plant that, you know, sometimes when a plant is eating above what we mean by carnivory, but it's, a, it's sort of a, it's not a really well-defined term. It's hard to define. Um, and some plants seem to be partial carnivores. So a strange thing about sage is we have quite a few of these identified proto-carnivores. So what essentially is happening is that they have proteus activity on the surface. So the plants aren't just, sometimes a plant will have sticky hairs on it just to deter insects, just to keep them getting eaten. But these plants have protease activity. So the plant doesn't, or the bug doesn't just stick, it sticks and dissolves, but they can't track any nitrogen going into the plants. So that at this point, these plants don't seem to actually be eating the bugs or just dissolving them. It's, it's, it's interesting and it's not, you know, not really well understood, but uh, some of the protocarnivores we have include Wo Rosa woodsii, uh, uh, Erythranthri rubescens, um, Drymacallus gondulosa, uh, Richardson geranium, Shepherd's purse, Ribes, Cerium, uh, Ipomopsis aggregata. I mean, there's are plants that you don't really would, you would never really suspect, you know, doing anything untoward. All right, so remember that little pool I told you about? Keep in mind. So let's go to the pool. There are a couple of little pools like that up at Sage Chen, including at the, um, the headwaters. So they, they have really interesting little animals in them, like these giant fairy shrimp and little um, salamander larvae, which are, you know, some of the, the easternmost extended the long toed salamander is uh, you know, in the area. But they also have this weird plant on the right. So this is quillwort, it's Isoedes bolanderi. And on the left picture, we've got a picture of photosynthesis, right? This is a cool picture of moss photosynthesizing in, in a meadow. So it's uh, doing its thing. It's eating sunshine and excreting pure oxygen and pulling carbon out of the air and make sugar. So, you know, if you didn't know that plants did that and if somebody just told you that, you'd be flabbergasted. But there are different ways of, of photosynthesizing. And this little plant, the gold in ponds, uses CAM photosynthesis. So that's crassulation acid metabolism. And it's a really peculiar process developed by, by um, desert plants because photosynthesis is not terribly efficient. So it respires about 92% of the water into the air. And if you're a desert plant, you can't really afford that. So what these uh, desert plants do in CAM photosynthesis is they open up their stomata at night to let carbon in and they store it in vacuoles in the form of malic acid. And then when the sun comes up, they slam the door, and then they release that that uh, vinegar to the uh, uh, to the Calvin. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Calvin cycle uh, during the day. So that way they can hang on to their water. So I was puzzled by this because you know quillworts live in the water. There's no lack of water in the water. So why would you want to photosynthesize this way? But it turns out that what's really going on is it's a carbon shortage. There's not enough carbon in the water. There's no limestone up there. It's all these uh, basalts and andesites, these you know, volcanic rocks. And um, it's a little acidic from all the pine resin up there. This is a bad condition for carbon. And if you're waiting for carbon to diffuse through from the air, carbon diffuses 10,000 times slower in water than it does in the air. So there's just not a lot of carbon. So what these little plants do in opening up at night is that they're sucking up all the available carbon before the sun comes up and the algae and everybody else turns on and sees that there's nothing to eat. So they're very efficient. You can kind of see in the background that not much else grows in this pond. That's pretty cool. Another thing about photosynthesis that's interesting to think about is only 5% of all living organisms are autotrophs. So all the rest of us parasitize these little guys, all the animals, fungi, some bacteria and protists. Just 
And of those measly 5%, almost all of them use chlorophyll to accomplish their task, except for some of those bacteria that I just told you about, the ones that use chemo, you know, chemicals, energy, chemotropic bacteria. Um, these organelles, the uh, chloroplasts, as well as mitochondria are things that were actually incorporated into the cell like a little lap dog or something. They were their own little organism. They're such a good idea that uh, these other cells decided to let them grow inside them. However that happened, it's still rather mysterious. And we know this, they're not produced in cell division, but they have to be inherited. Um, so almost all life on earth is dependent on the strange occurrence of a single organism that figured out how to eat sunshine. And the fact that other organisms thought it was such a good idea that they somehow managed to adapt it and put it in their own cell structure. So that's, that's a really weird idea. You know, in evolution, a good idea usually happens a lot. Um, you know, the eye evolved 50 or 100 times, depending on how you define an eye. So that's a really interesting thought. All right, so this may be what you came for. This is the money shot, right? This is the <laughs> big wildflowers. Uh, Seichang does have big showy displays of wildflowers in a good year. Um, on the left here, this is the Headwaters Meadow, which is uh, a beautiful season with lots of little elephant heads and Erigeron glacialis and some Antonaria, just really pretty. Um, but we're famous for the camas lilies in the upper right here. So in a good year and like early June, the lilies are like a purple haze on the meadow. It's really quite striking. It's a huge tourist attraction. A lot of people show up just to see these lilies. But I think that what most people don't know is that once the lilies are over, there are other flowers that come in. So we have, uh, once the lilies die, you'll often get a wave of purple Delphinium notalia. And, and uh, later in the summer, the, the meadows are full of uh, Penstem and Rybergii. And there are patches of oh, aspen onions, the allium biceptrum, that are actually really striking too. And this year we actually had, you know, beautiful displays of the uh, Lupinus lepidus and um, Navaricia leptilea. So don't just think about the camas lilies, there's a lot more going on. Um, let's see. But some of my favorite flowers at Seichen are just these little tiny things that are hidden and, and inconspicuous and not well known. So the, on the left is uh, Erythranthri breweri. And uh, that was a funny one. I, I knew they were, they were on the basin list. I've been looking for them. I, the way that I found them actually was I took a picture of something else and I realized that they were in the background. I didn't actually see them at the time. So they're beautiful. There's also a, a small nemophila, nemophila pedunculata. It's just a gorgeous little plant. It's usually underneath the grasses in the meadow. You don't, it doesn't jump right out. You have five species of tiny navaricia. There's a, a plagiobothrus. Um, and these sunflower meadows are, are kind of fascinating too because it's not generally just one sunflower. In this picture, I think there's six species of Aspiraceae, including the uh, balsam arises at and uh, Oethia mollis, and then several Agosterus and Agosterus species. So you kind of have to look close. But maybe the most interesting and cryptic plant that uh, we have at Sagen is this ugly little spud right in the middle on the top there. And what that is is a goosefoot, pit seed goosefoot, Chenopodium berlanderi. And what's really cool about that plant is that even though it's widely regarded as a weed today, it was once part of the Eastern agricultural complex of prehistoric North America. This is one of the first plants ever domesticated. Um, it's still cultivated in Mexico as a pseudo cereal, leaf vegetable, and for broccoli like flowering shoots. So the Eastern Agricultural Complex is one of about 10 independent centers of plant domestication in the prehistoric world. And uh, by about 1800 BC, the Native Americans of North America were cultivating several species of wild plants for food, um, transitioning from you know, hunter gatherers to uh, agriculture. And after 200 BC, uh, maize from Mexico came in and kind of displaced these plants to stop growing, but so the initial four plants known to have been domesticated were goosefoot, this, sunflower, which is Helianthus annuus, and marsh elder, Iba annua, and squash, Corbita pepa. So is this a native plant? I mean, what does that even mean? It's, if it's a plant that occurs irrespective of any human interference, this is really problematic for this plant and for the Sierras in, in general. So this is the second time I've mentioned this idea, so remember it and we'll think about that, talk about that later. All right, so what else? Riparian trees and shrubs. It's, you know, along the cor river corridor, there's a lot of cool stuff. The lodge poles are just beautiful trees. You know, they form this edge effect. We've got meadows and, and then dense trees. And the wildlife in the Sierras really likes this. It's the bedroom next to the kitchen. It can feel safe and dart out and snatch something to eat. 
um, in the more productive areas of the meadows. Uh, there's shrubs that grow in ecological, including these, you know, Rosa woodsii and uh, um, ribes in our maine. And these trees are just gorgeous. They're just, you know, they're, they're definitely the culture fire culture. They're, they're definitely people trapped in these trees. So that's what that picture is. There's um, five species of willow at Seichen. Um, one is an upland willow, schoolers willow. So it doesn't grow by the creek, but you can stand by this fish house and you can see the, elk, the other four species right there, including this uh, Pacific willow, Lassiandra, which is one that's really easy to identify. Willows can be hard, but this one has these little glands along the leaf margins and at the base of the petiole there, and then the uh, stipules are really distinctive as well. And sometimes you get this weird effect. Here's uh, Eric in the North Fork with this willow that just went nuts. So I don't know what this is. If anybody knows what it is, let me know. Maybe a virus or something like this. So there's also aspens, but aspens are secessional. And because of the suppression of fire, um, they are sort of being choked out of the basin. There aren't very many and they're very nutritious. So they're, they're popular and the beavers will mow them right off or the, the uh, red-breasted sap suckers also will girdle them and kill them off. So there are efforts to uh, you know, do aspen respiration in the basin. There's a cool riparian tree too, um, this big ponderosa here on the right. These are, well, ponderosas actually aren't that cold tolerant. There's one subspecies that was originally described as a species called the Washoe pine. And they described it from uh, Mount Rose, which is 10,000 feet. It's much higher than most of Tahoe, much colder because it's a uh, more inland, it's more continental climate rather than, uh, you know, maritime. So these trees uh, have much smaller cones. You can see the top here um, than a regular ponderosa and they're more cold, cold tolerant. And there's a, a, several of these that grow right along the creek in, at Seichen, which is interesting because they, you know, the distribution maps are incomplete and we didn't know that they were there. And so somebody might have to confirm, but I'm pretty sure that's what we've got. So once you get away from the water, what do you have? You have mixed conifer forest and brush fields at Seichen. You have a lot of that. So the trees um, change as you go up the basin. There's a lot of yellow pine down low, the Jeffreys and, and the, the Ponderosa and, and the lodgepoles down in the, you know, in the water, as I said. But up on the slopes, um, up higher, you get into, let's see here on the left, you see a, a hemlock. A, you know, the mountain hemlock, that's a western white pine. There's a red fir in the background, there's a white fir on the right. So this is sort of interesting. When you see, you can look at this picture and you see these are all kind of growing out of the same spot. It's like they're out of the same root ball. And um, Vladimir Provosadov told me what this is. He's one of Seichen's researchers who's in the basin every single day studying chickadee memory and cognition. Um, it has been for 25 years, a great guy. But uh, what he says is this is an old squirrel cache. So hundreds of years ago, some little squirrel buried all these seeds and then got eaten by a hawk or something. And these trees sprouted. So that kind of was a fascinating idea. Um, the brush fields, there's a lot of uh, Ceanothus, several species, Ceanothus glutinous, Ceanothus frustratus, for the most part. There's a little bit of white thorn, but not much. Um, and it's interesting, but uh, here's a paper you might want to read if you're interested in what I'm about to talk about. But uh, California has a lot of nitrogen fixers. And you know, there's been a lot of discussion about why that should be. Um, I don't know, Cercocarpus letifolius, Persia tridentata, Alnus incana, Cornus sericea, as well as the, the, the Ceanothus species all um, yeah, are nitrogen fixers. So yeah, Archicephalus patula, Nevidensis, Huckleberry oak, Chinkapin, two service berries, Prunus marginata, Schooler's willow, seven pieces, species of lupin. You know, this paper has an interesting take because they thought basically that it was about fire, fire ecology, but it turns out that it's actually aridity. So I don't know, I wonder why that would be, maybe because dry soil doesn't support as many microbes, but who knows, it's an interesting thought anyway. So here's some interesting stories about the conifers. Uh, conifers came along before flowers, so they didn't have targeted pollination, they just chucked immense amounts of <laughs> pollen to the wind and hope it hits something useful. So there are seasons where you see these vast waves of, you know, yellow clouds floating over the forest and landing in the, in the water. Um, let's see, to the right of that, this little bloody spot is kind of interesting. When lagomorphs eat pine needles in the winter, so uh, pikas and rabbits and hares, and it turns out porcupines, that's what this is, this is porcupine. When they eat pine needles in the winter, it turns their urine red. So these aren't kill sites. This is actually just a sign that they're eating pine needles. 
So conifers produce immense amounts of woody debris. Um, and what happens to it? Well, you know, lots of things. There are animals that deal with it, like these ants. Ants uh, invented most of the, or many of the technologies that humans came along millions of years later to make credit for, one of which is central heating. So they actually build mounds of uh, pine needles to create compost piles to heat their nests. And of course, um, termites to the right will eat some of the woody debris and carpenter ants in the lower left or left corner. Um, but one thing that's kind of fascinating is that these fossorial animals move more earth every year than tectonic activity, which is staggering. Um, there's also fungus, um, didn't used to be, you know, back in the old days. So when lignin was created, it would just get buried and turned into fossil, fossil fuel deposits. That's where those all came from. And fungus has evolved now that can, can actually dissolve, you know, dissolve the cellulose or the lignin. Um, this brown rot fungus produces an edible spore, uh, you know, an edible mushroom, I guess. Uh, the conifer chicken of the woods is quite delicious and breaks down the, the uh, lignin into little cubes and become part of the forest for a soil, but that's, um, you know, that's not fast enough. The east side is very dry and it's just not wet enough. And again, we're back to that pile of, of uh, wood, that cordwood. You know, this is 150 year old firewood, folks. It's just sitting there. The way that it gets recycled is with fire. So most sage and pines are fire adapted species, not the lodgepoles, they have thin skin, but they live in the riparian area where it doesn't burn very often. But the yellow pines, you can tell they have thick, thick bark that protects them from fire, unless you've got you know, a scar like this guy in the lower corner, too bad, where they let the fire on the inside. Otherwise, the, the bark keeps the fire out. Um, these trees also drop their lower branches so they don't wick fire up into their crowns. Um, and the coolest thing is their pine cones are round and sappy and woody. So when they catch fire, they start rolling. It's the bane of wildland firefighters. They have to dig big trenches to prevent it. But these pine cones will spread fire downhill because the trees love the fire. It clears out all of the competition, opens things up, makes nest, nest, uh, you know, an area for their little, uh, their little seedlings like this one here in the middle, you know, that can't compete with these shade tolerant species like white fir. Um, the other thing to notice about this is look how waxy this is. That little water droplet's not getting absorbed at all, is it, right? Um, if you get too much of this stuff built up, it can in, in, intrude uh, with uh, or impede water infiltration. So it actually kind of makes the situation worse if the, the soil itself is actually becoming waxy and water impermeable if you don't have enough fire. All right, so also when, when you don't have enough fire, the forest gets thick. And so um, there are plants that are uh, adapted to uh, take advantage of, you know, the little mycorrhizal network between the trees, which is the fungal network that ties the trees all together. I'm sure you guys Heard all about that. Some of the mycorrhizal cheaters at Sage Hen are uh, snow plants and uh, coral root, uh, pine drops, and weirdly, four species of gallium. Apparently, these are implicated as mycorrhizal cheaters, so it's not always the things you would expect. Uh, Orthelia segunda, uh, you know, these winter greens, the chimophila, the pyrola, these species are also, you know, they can photosynthesize, obviously, they're green, but they're also tapped into the mycorrhizal network, as are ferns. So, ferns are pretty interesting. They live in the shade, of course, and the way that they can do that, um, the world, world used to be dominated by ferns, right? But when flowering plants showed up, they had a hard time. So a few ferns are unchanged for 180 million years, but, but um, modern ferns, we have um, eight poly, what are they, polypodiopsida at Seichen. Um, they acquired a critical low light photoreceptor called uh, neochrome via horizontal gene transfer from hornworts. So that's really crazy. Uh, this happens all the time in bacteria, the sharing of genes, but it was formerly thought to be unheard of in multi multicellular organisms, which is an assumption, assumption that's being forced to change, though it's still really poorly understood. Um, anyway, this adaptation allowed ferns to survive competition from the <coughs> flowering plants by exploiting shady niches where most plants can't manage. We actually owe our modern climate to ferns, and I'm going to put this up there because this story is just mind boggling. If you don't know about it, you know, Google the Azole event, these little ferns are just incredible. <laughs> All right, so there are other ways that plants can uh, avoid having to make an honest living. <laughs> Plant parasites, uh, we have some interesting ones at Sage Hen, like uh, the mustard flower rust up here in the upper left corner. It, uh, it takes advantage of the mustard plant and to create this flower-like, you know, 
structure. It's almost like a gall that tricks bees into coming and spreading their, their uh, you know, their spores around. Um, mistletoe. So we have, you know, several dwarf mistletoes in base. We do have one species of, of leafy mistletoe, and it doesn't look very leafy, called Phoridendron juniper, and it lives on the juniper trees. Um, and it's, you know, it's just an amazingly, <laughs> well, mistletoe plants are just so lazy that they've even offloaded a shockingly large percentage of their fundamental metabolic function to their hosts, um, including an entire respiratory complex, which has never been seen in any kind of life before. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. Um, daughter, California daughter, um, it's an interesting plant. Um, they actually hunt for their hosts. It's funny to see the little seedlings kind of whipping around, sniffing around, looking for the host. You might want to Google that. It's a great video. Um, some other plant parasites are often root parasites at Seichen. So the pedicularis, of course, and the, the aphylon, um, orthocarpus, cordylanthus. And uh, we have like five species of Castilea that are also root parasites. Beautiful root parasites. Uh, plant gall shrubs. Sometimes you're looking for these plants, you'll see these things are pretty fascinating. They're abnormal outgrowths of plant tissue, can be caused by various parasites, from viruses, fungi, bacteria to uh, plant, uh, I'm sorry, other plants, insects, and mites. So um, these insects, interestingly, produce plant hormone mimics in their saliva that trick the plant into. Um, uh, manipulate, well, they take control of and manipulate plants' growth, basically, which is wild. Sometimes they even manipulate the plant at the genetic level. Um, so the plant gall calls are often highly organized structures that, uh, so that the cause of the gall can be determined without actually seeing the insect. Um, so this is kind of cool. Look at this. So, <laughs> I mean, the only thing that has to do with galls is we have a, you know, an insect that's eating a manzanita leaf gall. Um, somehow, but this is not an ant. So look at this thing. This is crazy. This is an ant mimic. This is actually a beetle. You can see because ants don't have rostrum. See, it's stabbing in there to get a sip of whatever it's trying to sip from. And this this insect has wings. So there's uh, ants don't, don't look like that at all. But ant mimics are really cool. Apparently, ants are just unpleasant for most things to eat. If you try to eat one, it'll fight back, and you don't get a whole lot of calories in it anyway. So they just generally avoid it. All right. Um, all right, so we're going to get back to all those things that I said I'll talk about later. So human history's effect on sage and botany and what natural or native really means. So, so here are two photos. Um, hmm. yeah, I should first say there's some very challenging out of the box ideas here that, you know, when, when I first heard them, I kind of resisted because I'm a pretty committed environmentalist, but I struggled to accept these things at first. Um, so please think hard about these issues. So these are two photos of a forest. So I didn't, you know, I had to steal something from the internet because I didn't have a picture of the Sierra San Pedro Martir, which is a Sierra forest in Mexico that's higher, that has the same plant composition as the, as the Sierra Nevada. So it was never logged and it was never fire suppressed until quite recently. So it is probably as close to a natural Sierra forest as you can get. And we used it for um, the Sage and Forest Project, I'll tell you about a little later. So on the right is um, a forest at Seichen that uh, was kind of left alone to grow back on its own. And this is what we got. So, which is, you know, these are two natural forests, but they're both actually man-made, right? I mean, we had Native Americans burning on the left and we had humans clear cutting and then leaving things alone on the right. So, I, you know, what would Sierra and forest look like if we left them alone? We're kind of finding that out. I mean, what's a, what is a native plant? I mean, remember that goose that we discussed, um, native to North America, but to California? How would you know? I mean, is this, which of these is the native Sierra landscape? I mean, if you're talking about a landscape without human effects, I mean, it turns out that forests are managed, are human artifacts. They're managed by people. And the way we've been managing it for the last couple hundred years is not very good. So we need to kind of change that. Um, Americans have a wilderness ethic that's based on a misconception about North American continent being an untouched wilderness, um, when in fact it was really a Native American garden for at least 13,000 years. Um, then it was depopulated by European diseases advanced ahead of the immigrants and the newcomers had very different ideas about what forests are good for. So sadly, 
due to a century and a half of unfair dealing by the timber industry, there's serious mistrust of industry and conflict within the environmental community about what we should do. And there's an emerging trend of people thinking that we should just let it burn. And that's disastrous. Um, this is what you get when you do that. Eventually you get brushlands with little copses of trees that burn off once in a while. So is that really what we want? I mean, here's an article that I really recommend that you read. It's, it's an old one and there have been some books by the same author since then, if you, you know, Charles Mann, if you'd like to look those up. But 1491 in the Atlantic um, is just a fascinating article that will help you kind of uh, discuss, you know, think about these issues in a very different way. Um, but the problem is, try as we well, might, we can't put out these mega fires anymore. So what are we going to do? So let's look at Sage Hen's situation and solution. So this is Sage Hen. Uh, this is a shot from 1978. There's the creek. Um, there's the field station right there, kind of in the center with all the meta systems. And this is the Donner Ridge fire scar. In 1960, a fire swept through, burned 45,000 acres, just kept going until it hit the uh, yeah, I hit the Great Basin around out of things to burn, and it was a preview of things to come. So since then, um, it's been replanted, um, and it's grown back, and it's too thick. And if you light it on fire at this point, it all goes up, and it just destroys it. So if you look at the forest, you can see these old stumps, Comstock era stumps. So we can study these things, since it's so dry, to find out what the fire regime was like before European intervention and uh, you know what the distribution of trees were, were. And so we have a way to find out I and mean, we don't have to guess. So one thing we learned in a study at Sage was that the fire return interval has changed. So prior to European intervention, there was a fire somewhere in the basin every two and a half years. And that's what we learned from these stumps. After contact, that interval went to 24 years. So that explains why we've got you know, this problem. Also the Donner Ridge fire that yeah, that outline that I showed you is uh, that burned along mapped Comstock slash. So when they, you know, I said, they pulled out everything they could that they could sell. And they left everything else still sitting there like that cordwood. And that's why, why this fire burned so hot and so destructively because of those that built up fuel. So let's get out of here. <laughs> we can't go back just one step. Okay. So when we got to Sage Chen, um, you know, in 2001, there were some big fires. We spent our first summer just stuck in smoke. And so it got our attention, you know, rather intensely. And so we kept our eyes open for a way that we could kind of help out. And uh, in 2004, the Forest Service adopted their, their framework too, which is a re-evaluation of their forest plan and how they should be managing their lands. And, in that, they opted this plan called SPLATS, Strategically Placed Land Area Treatments, which was a theoretical strategy for interrupting fire behavior that allowed you to thin only, uh, I don't know, like 30% of the landscape instead of the entire landscape because it's very expensive to thin. And if you don't thin before you start bringing fire back, it's gonna get out of control. So we thought that would be a good idea. And we adopted that. We got, you know, found some Berkeley researchers connected to the Forest Service. They got a big joint fire sciences grant and they did a bunch of data collection. Um, you know, 512 plots where they measured every single tree, every single bit of fuel, everything in that in that forest, and then they used it to to uh, uh, ground truth lidar, the new technology of lidar, and to uh, develop some fire models that were actually more efficient. But the effect of this was that we discovered that yes, this would work, but this would work to disrupt fire behavior. But people freaked out about the idea of slapping this kind of treatments on the landscape with you know no thought or consideration for water or wildlife or anything else. So um, we put together a consortium with a bunch of people. This is probably Sachin's most important botany work, actually. So we got a bunch of people together and started the Face Sachin Forest Project. And there's a blog. You can take a look at you know, what, what it's about. But what it did was it brought in everybody who had an interest in this at the ground level before we had a big plan and said, look, what do you think we should do about this? And nobody thought it would work, but after 18 months, we hammered out a prescription that has the agreement of both environmentalists and loggers. And this idea has now been um, adopted at the California legislative level, but it still needs your help to you know, keep reminding people that we need to do this. We need to have prescribed burn. We need to put up with a little bit of smoke so we don't have to put up with a lot of smoke, things like this. So the way that it works roughly is that it adopts 
surface area treatment. So basically, instead of treating every acre the same as in the past, you just you have an evaluation of the highest value of each acre. So if it's really great wildlife habitat, you know, where they den, you leave that alone. You don't thin it. They like it like that. But if it's a, you know, a sunny, hot, south facing slope where the wind blows, that's where fire is really going to run. So you thin that really hard. And you leave the big trees, which are fire resistant, you take out the little trees. So this was great. This really, um, and then of course you get fire back into the system in a controllable light way. So this is fantastic. And so what's happened? The thing is, it's very new. We're still monitoring. We don't know for sure, but iNaturalist is helping us figure out some changes and things that we're seeing are that plants that haven't been seen since the 1970s are coming back, like this uh, Lewisia triphyla and uh, sugar stick, Polytropa regatta. Um, you know, anytime you burn, you get morel mushrooms, right? So we're getting mushrooms, we're getting these big fields of flowers in the openings, like this uh, Navarisha leptilea, and wildlife is coming back. So um, there used to be building ground squirrels in the basin. They vanished um, as the forest grew up, and recently one showed up again. And I naturalist took a photo of one. And along with that, we are seeing birds like the uh, fruit in this pot that have never been seen in the basin. Never, well, you know, never been documented in the basin. They've probably been through, but this is, this is pretty exciting stuff. All right, so that's pretty much what I have to say. You should do work at SageHen, absolutely. If you need to get in touch with somebody, you know, Ash Semenik is the current station manager and that's where you wanna, that's who you wanna talk to about work. But if you have any questions for me or for Erica, here are our, our email addresses and you can, you know, get back to us. Uh, if you want those stories about botany and ecology that I talked about and glossed over and want more detail or you want some, some references, you can go to this link and get that. And I really encourage you to get uh, join us on iNaturalist. You can download our plant list. You can uh, you know contribute your own observations to our distribution and presence and absence data moving forward. So I hope you will. I really hope you will. Um, okay, so next... Uh, Erica Krimmel is going to talk to you, but I have to say one of the best things about herbarium work is reading these whole newspapers. They're just so bizarre. <laughs> and okay, Erica's been one of my favorite people since she strode into Seichen about 10 years ago um, with her newly minted undergrad degree in library science under her arm, asking if she could do something with our musty old teaching collections that she somehow heard about. So at that time, we've been told that these small collections had no real value and many institutions were chucking theirs in dumpsters, thanks to shrinking public budgets. So, um, we just handed everything over to her capable and energetic hands and the resulting collections program became a kernel of her graduate work and a productive new research asset, not just for Sage Hen, but also Norfolk for the American. And the focus of Sage Hen's volunteer program, a model for the rest of the country and absolutely one of the funnest things that I did during my time in the reserve. So thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks Farland for all the, I love a good bouquet of Sage Hen stories and that was, uh, that was an excellent iteration. So. Um, and thanks to all of you guys who are here with us tonight. It's really fun to talk to you. Or then if you wanna stop sharing your screen. Perfect. Yeah, sorry. What is it? Stop. <laughs> Actually, so I think I can steal control. That's great, thanks, good. That's perfect. Um, so yeah, like Farthen said, my name is Erica Krimmel. I walked into Sage Hen about 10 years ago and it kind of like, was a, was a great place for me to spend um, three or four solid years uh, while I was working on my master's degree, both before and a little bit after. So uh, my background is I have an undergrad degree in environmental science from UC Santa Cruz, and then I moved to Tahoe to be a ski bum as one does. Uh, and then I got bored of being a ski bum, so needed to like do something a little more intellectual and found Sage Hen and found the collections there. And that pushed me into a graduate program in library and information science. Uh, and so now I work with museum collections. So biological specimens that are held at natural history museums and also at universities. And I work for a project called IDIG Bio, which is funded by the National Science Foundation to help natural history collections. And I live in Sacramento, so I'm, I'm still local. So I just have about 15 or 20 minutes of an end cap for Farthen's uh, bouquet of stories, um, where I really just wanna give you guys a sense of what the collections at Sage Hen are um, and why it was really fun for Farthen and I to take this kind of forgotten teaching collection and really elevate it to, to the level that a lot of the research collections at um, more, more larger institutions like universities or museums are at. 
So in terms of Sage Hens collections, they're both tiny and if you need to do anything with them, not that small, um, but it, in the scale of what other collections are like, they're small. So we're talking less than 2000 uh, herbarium specimens, so dead plants, um, same like 1600 insect specimens, and then a couple hundred birds and a couple hundred mammals. We also at one time had about 30 jars of specimens in formalin and we got rid of those, sent them down to UC Berkeley because those are um, kind of nasty things to store and have around. If you're not familiar with natural history or biodiversity collections, this is what they are. You know, it's a it's dead plants and animals in cupboards um, stored nicely so that we can access those physical specimens for ideally hundreds of years in the future. It's essentially a library of life and it's essentially a time capsule. So it's really cool. Like if you have the opportunity to work with specimens as part of your job or as a volunteer opportunity, it's a great way to learn a little bit more about the natural world um, in a way that can't run away from you. You know, I never really liked birds until I was prepping bird specimens and then suddenly they were very interesting. They're not like flying away from you. And plants stay still. I assume that's why we're all into botany, uh, but still, if you have a, a, an herbarium specimen, you're just able to see different features of the plant than you might be able to, or you might notice in real life. So like I said, the Seijian collections were primarily developed as a teaching collection, which means that when researchers would come to Seijian and they were doing research or teaching classes, they might collect specimens to use in their instruction, like oh, you need to learn how to identify this kind of plant. Well, cool, look at this dead version that I collected last year and you can it can help you. Um, and then those things just kind of got left at the station. So over time, we built up this collection. Um, and specimens have been, so you can see on here a timeline of when our major collecting periods were. And really most of our specimens were collected in the mid to late 60s with another little boom in the 80s. And then Farthan and I are that last little peak in the um, like 2012, 13, 14. I wanna give you a brief context for where Sagehen sits in terms of other field stations. Lots of field stations have collections, biological collections. Um, in the UC Natural Reserve System, there are certainly um, lots of specimens in different reserves. So the reserve system, which Seijian is part of is 41 different properties um, or reserves. And we've got about 165,000 specimens all said and done. So if you think about that, that's actually like a lot of uh, material. And they're both really the standard kind of things you might expect, like here is a herbarium specimen. They're also really unique resources in some cases because they were created for a really specific research use. Like if someone was doing a master's thesis and thinking about say the botanical flora of the basin really thoroughly, um, that's a different way to do research and collect specimens than just kind of a one-off like, oh, I got this plant and I put it in the herbarium. So, like zooming out even from the UC or University of California Natural Reserve System, field stations in general have collections typically. Um, about 90% of field stations reported that they curate collections in a survey we did in 2013. Um, and these collections have a few characteristics that make them different from the collections that are held at natural history museums or universities. So. A couple of those things are that the specimens are almost always used on site. Um, at a museum, it's really typical to like ship a specimen away so that somebody at another institution can look at it. That's not something that field stations really do. They're, they're using the resources on site. Specimens at field stations are also not duplicated. When I'm talking about things being duplicated, that might seem weird because like how can you take a plant and then turn it into two plants and then have two dead plants? But in terms of herbarium collections, duplication is really common. So back in the day when it took a while for information to get places, it was really like a best practice for if you were collecting a flower um, to just collect a second flower at the same location and then you send it to your buddy on the East Coast and that way they don't have to come to California. 
um, they can just stay at Harvard and, and look at their flower specimen there. So most larger herbaria have a lot of duplicate specimens, which is great. Um, it's really nice insurance in case something happens to a collection, like, um, I don't know, there's a fire in a building and everything burns down. Um, but at field stations, there's very little duplication. So what that means is the specimens are representing something really unique. And then finally, specimens at field stations tend to complement existing and potential research happening on the site. So they are very place-based. Just a quick scope on, on the taxonomic holdings at field stations. Um, so what this is showing is uh, like about 70% of field stations have plant collections or herbaria. Um, about 40% have insect collections. And then the other taxonomic disciplines are much more varied. But basically most field stations have an herbarium. So that's a, a great thing to know if you're traveling or, or interested in um, visiting other field stations and seeing their collections. So at Seijin, the way that our collections um, had been and still are used is as a teaching collection. They're used on site for things like educational programs with local students, like it are shown in these images. It's really powerful to be able to hand a kid a dead bat and tell them like, this is what a bat is. It, it's a lot more meaningful than looking at a picture of a bat or a video of a bat or something that represents a bat, but is not a bat. Um, so, so this is a way that a lot of sage and specimens get used. And, you know, vertebrates are a little more glitzy and glammy than plants. So the herbarium gets used a little bit less this way, um, but it's still, it's a teaching collection. So the herbarium might be used more for university classes or um, professional development, like the courses offered by um, certain CNPS chapters um, as an educational resource that way. And again, on site. We don't need to get too into this table, but um, basically I was part of a research project and we were looking at uh, whether or not small collections have a meaningful amount of holdings. Like, should we just get rid of all the little smaller barrier and just send everything to the big museums? And the answer was definitely not because the small collections have a lot of unique specimens. And this was extra true for field stations. So here's just a couple field stations that were in our data. And you can see that um, three of them, the specimens that they had are everything they had is unique. And the others, it's all over 50% unique. Okay, so that's just like mumbo jumbo, but in terms of an example, here's what I mean. So this was one of the field stations in our data. And um, if you, this is, it's from a field station in Michigan. I know, going out of state. Um, but the Michigan flora, which uh, is, you know, a pretty canonical great resource for the state of Michigan, doesn't have any record of Apocynum cannabinum in this county. But this biological station, this field station herbarium, does have a specimen that was collected here. Nobody, nobody knows about it, but they have one. And if you were to look at our global knowledge of this county in Michigan, our global um, data resources also don't know that this species occurs in this county. So again, like field stations are really good at knowing a lot about this small little area that they curate, and that's across the board, but it definitely translates to herbaria and other bio biological collections. Okay, and so that then kind of like leads us into the fact that field station specimens are really enabling research. And we saw this at Sage Hen with our herbarium in particular, but also with our non-plant collections. So these are just a couple photos that represent several examples of research at Sage Hen that was either inspired or informed by our biodiversity collections. Um, the photo on the right is a Ceanothus that uh, we were collecting specimens of and making observations on iNaturalist, and we ended up sending duplicates of these specimens to some um, botanists who uh, we're, we're revising the taxonomy and ended up describing a new hybrid species. In the middle, we've got a area, a little fritillary, and also the collection tag from a Sierra red fox. And those were part of a couple research studies that were looking at population model modeling for the butterfly um, and genetics for the red fox. The genetics thing is cool 
because as I said earlier, specimens are, they're like a time capsule. So you can't go back to 1970, but if you wanted to look at the genetics of a red fox in 1970 in the Tahoe area, we have one. You could you can get DNA out of some of these older mammal and bird specimens and plant specimens as well. And then the pink flower is a mimulus or an erythranthi probably now. Um, and that's uh, an example of a, we had a grad student from the University of Toronto who was studying niche breath in this group and looking for populations to collect seed from. And Farland and I knew exactly where those populations were at Seichen. Okay, but now we get to this like pinch point where like, how do people know that you have specimens at your field station? Um, like how, how would they ever know that? Um, and that the way that people end up finding that out is um, through something called digitization. So that's a relatively new, as in the last like 20, 30 years thing that collections are doing to make our specimens discoverable. So I like to think of this as like, or the analogy I often use is if you wanted to check out a book from the library, but you had to like call every one of your branch libraries to see if they had the book. And when you called those libraries, you were going to talk to a librarian and then the librarian had to call the other branches. You would just give up looking for books. You'd just go and like take whatever book you could because it's too much trouble. That was and kind of still is where uh, biological collections are. So we have tons and tons of cabinets in thousands of institutions holding millions, maybe billions of dead things. And we're not exactly sure, we can't really like look up what all those dead things are or where to find them. But through digitization, we are attempting to make that data more available and more discoverable. So basically, instead of having to sift through a cabinet full of herbarium specimens, uh, we'd like it to be so that you could just search in a database and find out that there is or isn't an herbarium specimen of interest. And the way that we are doing this in collections is through something called GBIF or the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And it is a global database of biodiversity information. So it includes both specimens and observation records. So anything that is saying a species occurred at a place at a time is data that goes into GBIF. And for collections, including SageHen, what we do is we transcribe label data. So we take all of the information that someone wrote about on a paper label. We type it up into a spreadsheet or a database. Um, we might take a picture of a specimen and then we ship it off to these folks at GBIF and they make it searchable. I just wanted to highlight why we image herbarium specimens. Um, and so here's an example of what an image of an herbarium specimen looks like. We're taking the specimen and we're taking a picture of it along with a scale and color bar. And we can take really high quality photos. So in the middle, I've zoomed in on this, this part of the plant and you can see a lot of the flower features um, enough to identify a lot of different taxa. So sometimes, whereas previously you might've needed to get the physical specimen in order to do your research, nowadays, sometimes researchers can look at an image and that's a good enough proxy. I'm just gonna tell you about a whirlwind history of digitizing the herbarium at Seichen. So we started in 2011. We were just kind of transcribing and imaging specimens, um, working with whatever we had. Um, there wasn't any kind of budget for doing this work. So it was just me volunteering at Seichen um, and do, working with what we had. But we were able to get the data from our specimens online through something called the California Consortium of Herbaria which is a really great organization and website web portal um, that shares information on specimens from all of the herbaria in California. And even in this very beginning through the act of digitizing these specimens, we were increasing the botanical knowledge of the sage hen basin. So we realized that there were eight species that we had specimens of that weren't on the basin list. And so we could add those. 
Um, in 2013, we started getting a, a bigger cadre of volunteers. And so we could do things like mount all these unmounted specimens. So mounting is just taking the dried specimen and gluing or taping it on um, an archival sheet of paper. It's time consuming, it's fun. Um, we need a lot of people to do it. So that was a really fun um, period of work. And then in 2013, we started getting a little bit more um, up to date technologically. We migrated our specimen data into a database and we started doing some targeted collecting. So basically Farthen and I were looking at what we already had records of in the herbarium. And we were trying to augment that with new collections. So going out and trying to find species that either hadn't been documented with a specimen or had been documented but it was 50 years ago. And then in the last five years, um, we've done a little bit of collection curation in terms of transferring stuff that wasn't collected at Sagen to a larger herbarium, Jepson at Berkeley. Um, doing some more imaging, we made some contacts at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and we were able to travel down there with a bunch of boxes of specimens and use their super nice camera equipment. And then we also got our data published to GBIF. So this is a really exciting period because we kind of took a lot of work that had been happening in the previous five years and, and really um, with a small amount of work made a big impact. And we're, we're always, digitization never really stops. So um, this year and beyond, we have all this ongoing maintenance. Um, so keeping digital records up to date with things like nomenclatural changes, um, we want to be digitizing our newly collected specimens. And then also kind of keeping track of who's using our specimen data that's, that's been digitized. And so here we are back at this slide, but this is where we're at. So we have all of our specimen data available on this Global Biodiversity Information Facility feels really cool to go look at it and see that Sage and Creek Field Station has, you know, this many occurrence records. Um, and you can also see this, we've got 123 citations. So that means that our data has been used by 123 different publications. That's crazy. Like this, this data from these specimens had been used zero times in the past 60 years for publications. So just a, a quick context on what the Global Biodiversity Information Facility is, um, is that it's a, it's a global um, network of data and there's a ton of data in it. So it's coming from institutions all over the world. It's again, anything related to a species in a place at a time. And it's kind of the one-stop shop for researchers looking for this kind of data. One thing that's really cool about publishing our collections data to GBIF is that it gets added to this bigger context. So um, I don't know if you remember from a couple of slides ago, but we have about 4,000 specimen records that we are publishing to GBIF. Well, if you go look at the Seijian Basin in GBIF and you say, how many specimen records are there? There's 11,500. So there's a ton of other records of specimens that Seijian isn't curating but they were collected at Seichen. So we're kind of able to digitally reunite all these um, specimens that, you know, they originated at the same place, but they have since been dispersed. And they're in a broad taxonomic range, arthropods, vertebrates, smallest plants, fungi. They also have a broad historical range. So our specimens date back to the 1960s, some of them in the 1950s, but on GBIF, we're seeing specimens that were collected in, in 1818. So that's pretty cool. Our timeline, our time capsule gets extended. And then, like I said, this data is coming from a lot of different collections. So there's actually 92 distinct biodiversity collections that are contributing data or that hold specimens collected at Sagehen. So that's a pretty cool network. And this is kind of important because um, site-based data produced at field stations is often disseminated by research genres. So if you're a hydrologist, you're gonna share your data with the other hydrologists. If you're an ecologist, you're gonna share your data with the ecologists. If you're a plant taxonomy, plant taxonomist, you'll share your data with the, the taxonomists. Um, but by sharing our collections data via GBIF, we're really like reuniting not only the 
the disparate um, institutions holding the data, but we're reuniting those different research genres. And so here's just a couple examples of the, the different institutions that have specimens that were collected at SageN. And some of them are pretty like obvious connections, like uh, the third one on this list, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology is at UC Berkeley and SageN has from the beginning had an association with Berkeley. So that makes sense. But like, why does McGill University have a bunch of specimens collected at SageN? I don't know, but that's interesting. And some of the other types of specimens that were collected at SageN and are held by other institutions are really interesting. So um, some of them have been digitized to a much uh, like greater, more specific research need than we would have done. For instance, this ant has been imaged using a, a like microscope style of imaging. And so it's, it's a tiny animal that's imaged very high quality. We would never be able to take this photo ourselves. There's also a little fish specimen. We don't have any fish specimen at SageN, but here's one that somebody else has. And then some collections are maintaining things like audio records. So this is a, an audio recording of a crossbill that is, uh, was recorded at SageN. So we're, be, we're able to reunite all of this data in this one central searching place. Okay, and then I told you that um, SageN had 102 publications or 123 citations for all of our specimen data that's been shared. And 102 of those are publications that are citing our herbarium data. And these are just a couple examples of the types of papers that people are writing with data from our herbarium specimens. So it's a really broad range. Okay, and then we're gonna go back to local from global. So we were just talking about like, oh, all the data, all the places, um, and now, now we're back at SageN and the implication that for the uh, effects that digitizing our collection had at SageN was it really activated our interest in the flora of the basin. So Brethren and I got really into plant hunting. Um, and in a few years, we were able to add 60 new vouchered specimen firsts for the SageN herbarium. 10 of those are species that were totally new to the basin list. We didn't have a record of them in the herbarium and they were not on the existing flora lists either. We also added over 200 new vouchers or herbarium specimens for the North Fork of the American River, which is the two associated properties that Farthen talked about at the beginning of her talk. And 17 of those species were new to that um, flora. So this is really interesting because these it's low hanging, some of these are really low hanging fruit. No one had just taken the time to realize that they weren't on lists. And as part of our plant hunting, we got really into iNaturalist, which I think most of you are familiar with in this chapter. Um, but iNaturalist is a community or a citizen science platform for collecting data about species occurrences. So again, a species in a place at a time. Um, and usually on iNaturalist, that's accompanied by a photo or some other kind of media. And iNaturalist is just the most wonderful way to like engage the public, engage other scientists, um, all while collecting really useful data. Um, so I'm excited for our BioBlitz on Saturday and I hope a lot of you are planning to come, uh, but I think we'll be using iNaturalist. Um, and it's a, it's a fun way to, to connect directly with the people who are experts in certain taxa. So Farland had a link for uh, the Sagehen Creek Basin um, at the end of her talk, and that's the same link that's on this slide. But basically we have a kind of a home or a landing page on iNaturalist for any flora and fauna that occur in this geographical region. Um, and that allows us to keep track of all of the work and activity that's been happening on iNat. So that includes, you know, 14 and a half thousand observations 9,600 of which are of plants. And those represent 15, almost 1,500 species, almost 500 of which are plants. And those observations are being made by 1,200 or 483, 400 observers, and then being identified by like magnitudes more. So 
iNaturalist, again, is just like an amazing engagement tool because um, if you look at like the 445 people identifying and 403 people observing, that's a lot of humans um, and they're all contributing data to this one special place, this field station. So if we circle back to GBIF, we talked about how many specimen records GBIF knows about. It knows about about 11 and a half thousand specimens that are collected at Sage Hen and held all over the world at different institutions. But if we add the observational data, which is primarily coming from my naturalist, we have 42,000 records of species occurring at Sage Hen. And that's just really cool. If you're a researcher or just a curious person and you want to know about biodiversity in this place, this is amazing. You have 42,000 little pinpoints that you can um, look at and explore and get curious about and deep dive into in different directions. So that's my end cap. Um, like Farlin said uh, at the end of her talk, feel free to reach out at any time if you have questions about anything that seems like I might have an answer or a thought on. Um, and also, if you can, if you feel like it, you can find me on iNaturalist at eKermel. Okay, that was a lot of talking from us. Um, but uh, I think we do have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any. And I, I think I'll let Chrissy take it over for moderating any questions. Thank you so much, Barthen and Erica. Woo! Wow, I can I can hardly wait to go up to Sage Hen Creek on Friday and Saturday, and uh, and do the the hike and do the bio blitz, and I'm sure that's true for others as well. So thank you so very much. So we have a really uh, just a an interesting question uh, from one of your audience members. Are you two uh, kind of putting into the record some current newspapers that'll entertain Sage Hen Naturalist 50 years on? That's a good idea. I should start looking for like really weird headlines and just stick them in there. <laughs> Occasionally I, I add papers, but we just have this huge stack of stuff 60s it's amazing i mean just the ads and the you know the raging sexism <laughs> it's it's a, kind of funny it is really funny there's an article actually that was that i thought was really interesting it's about greg lamond racing in washoe county and apparently had no trouble with the local competition so that's good to hear uh -huh. Being one of the best bicyclists who ever lived of course yeah, we had so. a lot of productivity issues when we were trying to mount specimens because everybody would just get so distracted reading the old newspapers that it would have been like 10 minutes and you're like, oh, I, I've done nothing. I've just been reading. You know, so if anyone wants to own specimens, come to Sage Hen. So when you pack, you always have to turn the newspapers. If this is from someone who's moved many times. You have to turn the newspapers upside down when you start to wrap things in the newspapers. Oh. I know it's not the same thing, but it's the only way to get through the process. Oh. Yes. Okay. Yes, old newspapers are fascinating. So yeah, keep getting the ones that are about the coverage that we're getting today from Sage Hen uh, Field Station. And then the other thing is, of course, kind of maintaining the digital record from your blogs and, you know, iNaturalist and everything else that's, yeah, I know, nothing but time, right? Well, it's, I mean, it's beyond, it's more than time. It's really a tricky problem. I mean, this is a, there's been a lot of data lost, I think, in this intervening gap where everybody tried to decide whose responsibility it is to maintain all this electronica, you know, that's out there. The museums didn't want it at first, you know, the libraries didn't want it because it's just more money and they don't have a bigger budget to deal with it. So it's, it's nice that some of these, um, these organizations like GBIF and iNaturalist are stepping up and, and providing a home for that data. That's a really that's a really good point because and, it's just a bigger project for a little organization like right. It's really true. It's really true. Uh, it's like whoa, more to do and no more resources to do it with. Yes, um, one of one of your uh, audience members asks, "What is the difference in research usefulness between GBIF and iNaturalist?" They're both very useful. So. 
Um, if you are a citizen scientist contributing data to iNaturalist, you should know that your data is getting sent by iNaturalist to GBIF, and so it's accessible there for research use. And iNaturalist really likes people, researchers, to use data from GBIF because GBIF will keep track of um, how that data is getting used through citations. So on the flip side, researchers looking to iNaturalist for their data source are interested in not just the like this species at this place at this time, but some of that more like um, rich data. So if any of you have used any of the tagging functionality in iNaturalist to say like, this is in bloom, this is being pollinated by this other species, that kind of data is really rich. Um, and most researchers, depending on their interest, can only get that from iNaturalist directly versus from GBIF. So they're both totally useful just for different circumstances. Uh, somebody else asks, I think we're on an iNaturalist kick here. Um, on iNaturalist, it looks like most observations are along the creek. And she asks, is that just because that's where the trail is? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it brings up a point about um, you find what you look for, right? And, and bias in, in you know, data sets, I guess. People like being at the creek. That's why it's there. there. It's not really, there's a trail there. That's where people like to be. And, but there's also more biological richness and diversity where there's water. So you are going to see, you know, more different things. Also, as the forest gets thicker and grows up, you know, it chokes out a lot of other stuff. And so people don't really spend a lot of time poking around in there because you tend to go a long distance without seeing anything new, unless you've got really sharp eyes and you're looking for mushrooms or, you know, the, some of these mycorrhizal cheaters and you know that you're hunting for them. But there's a difference between wandering along, looking at wildflowers and plant hunting. Ah, and go ahead. Tell us what that difference is for those of us who might be in one camp and think, oh, would I ever be in the other one? Oh, I don't know. Erica, what do you think about this? Um, some of it is attentional, you know, you just, uh, you, you're looking deeply, you're not just wandering around seeing what catches your eye, you're actually intentionally searching for patterns and, and specific things. Yeah, plant hunting comes with this like cold, like the very primal urge that I find very satisfying. Uh, like We found it. Uh, but for what Farthen and I would often do is look in the historical species occurrences, like specimens that were collected a while ago for a, a taxa that we were hunting. Um, and that's really fun because you're looking at place names that have maybe changed or you're visiting parts of an area that you wouldn't normally go to. Um, so there's just a little more intentionality about plant hunting, as we call it. Yeah. Do you, do you, have you, to what extent have you, each of you found that over the years, your ability to spot a likely place where you're gonna find a different specimens or greater biodiversity, to what extent has that expanded? And do you have any tips for the rest of us on in that regard? Uh, it's certainly expanded. Um... Uh, you know, it's, it's like mushroom people are probably, you know, really familiar with this idea about you got to get your eyes on, right? When you walk out in the forest, you don't see mushrooms because they're not trying to get your attention the way flowers are. You, you have to learn to see them. So I think that's just a, you know, sort of a process that, that happens. Cool. Um, you had earlier mentioned um, a particular particular entrance you to the area I think this was somebody uh, well, asked about we, it. we did talk about the lower sage and creek hiking trail and that's uh, yes. the, you know, the place people go to see camas lilies and take their dogs right. yeah you just park on highway 89 right where sage and creek crosses the highway and hike from there so it's a pretty obvious trail it runs along and one you, of those uh, old railroad beds at first and uh, along the creek it's a good, it's and, a good and quality if, if value. you just put in Seichen Creek Trailhead, is that where you Low, get or do you get something? That's Creek. not it. Lower Seichen Creek. But uh, I think you also put up a link in the comments already uh, or in the chat already about uh, a PDF trail guide that one of our California naturalists mm -hmm. created that has good information, you know, a little good interpretive information about the area, not just the plants. So, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you, you sent that link 
and so now we have, oh, look, and there's the trailhead. Thank you very much for providing that, Erica. It's in the chat now. Okay. I'll put that in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so I then my, somebody asked yeah, about please. the public visit visiting the Camas lilies. Um, the lilies are not actually at the field station. They're, they're on the creek, on the lower Seichen Creek. So yeah, you can go there anytime. The station um, is not open to the public per se. You can't drive in there, but you can walk through. You know, if you want to walk through on the road, you're welcome to, um, you know, just be polite. Don't go in the buildings and things, you know, without permission. Yes. Yeah, thanks for answering that question. I'm sure a lot of people want to know. Yeah. Um, and uh, somebody asks, um, you mentioned that the sequoias nearby were planted by indigenous peoples. Hmm. And do we know, do you know, why they would do that? And and then how do we know that? I don't know, I don't know too much about that. Um, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, a lot of the things that they were doing were related to creating food plants and, and, and uh, actually, you know, keeping areas open for primary productivity for wildlife. Um, there's, you know, an interesting thing that happened um, with the loss of the Native American populations to disease in advance of the settlement wave is that, uh, I, there, you know, it was controversial when these ideas came out, the idea that 50 million people on the North American continent died, but it's looking counts. And one way that they know that is through the, uh, the, the last glacial advance of the Little Ice Age was triggered by the loss of these people because they were not keeping the areas open anymore. And the, trees grew up and sucked up all the carbon and chilled, actually cooled the climate. That many people died. So um, you learn about what these people were doing in very in, indirect ways, you know, and it very, you know, the effect of humans on the planet it is also often obscured by our expectations and, and um, desires, you know? I mean, we don't really want to think about some things in certain ways. And so, you know, it, it's tricky to get this, this change of, of perception and, and this new knowledge sometimes. So, I, you know, I don't know why Native Americans would be planting sequoias. I really don't. Probably because they like them. <laughs> why would you do it? Why do people do it now? They're beautiful trees. But maybe there was also some associated, um, some plant associations with them that were more practical and useful, you know, for not just food plants, but for, uh, you know, uh, textile stuff like the the washo burning riparian areas to encourage willow growth for for basketry materials. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, do, do are there ever any organized uh, oh field trips or programs that take in for the general public? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, you know, you'll just want to kind of check in with the field station as best you can. It's it's tricky for us because we're you know. Field stations are really low budget. They really are. And, you know, it helps if you will, if the public goes out and tells their elected representatives that they support science in their community, it really does help. Um, mm -hmm. If they don't hear it, then they can't, you know, they can't help because the university, we're so far from the, the campus that um, it, it, usually it's the field stations that get cut first, right? It's just easier to do that. We're so So there's not a lot of outreach and a lot of not a lot of, not of money for advertising. So we depend on volunteers, um, and we do you know we do have specific events like the Bio Blitz that we do for the public, and uh, you can come in and take a like a California naturalist class, or you can uh, you know join courses that are you know scheduled periodically, or this CNPS visit for instance. But okay. uh, yeah, it it helps to be proactive and not wait for us to get in touch with you because we we just don't have the capacity. Okay. Um, just uh, one question that I'm going to ask personally because I'm intrigued by it. I'm intrigued by the the art project or projects oh, yeah, that yeah. you mentioned. And um, is all the art at Sage Hint, is it all outdoors? Well, no. Um, we bring in artists who are interested in the same things that we are, and we bring them up to speed on what we're doing, and we kind of let them just do what they do. And so what they learn about forestry and fire and and uh, the research program kind of expresses itself in their work and it can be stuff that's at the field station there are a few pieces at the station but we're not a sculpture garden again we don't really have the budget for that so sometimes it's uh, you know it shows up somewhere else it's um 
it's in the community. Like one of our artists is really interesting, Julie Weitz. She, Weitz, she, uh, um, she has this character, she does this performance art with this character called her Golem, who's based on uh, Jewish folk tale traditions. And uh, so she brought a, her Golem out and, and learned to be a wildland firefighter or a red carding program for artists and scientists. And then uh, she did, you know, some videos about her Golem fighting fire. <laughs> the, the, this, this interesting, um, connection to Jewish historical fairy tales. And, and then she, you know, her work was exhibited at the uh, Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. So these things are happening all over the world, actually, with, with our artists. And it's, it's good because really this problem we have with fire is happening in all Mediterranean climates all over the world. And it's for the same reasons that people used to live in the forest and manage the forest, and they don't anymore. And in a lot of places, what that meant was people would live in the forest and they would take all this small brush and stuff, they'd make charcoal. So the industrial revolution and the, the advent of fossil fuels is kind of what caused a lot of the problems in other places. But I mean, understanding these forest issues, it's not, it's not a local problem. This is a global issue. So, mm -hmm. so we really like too. it when our artists go out and you know they don't have to produce an artwork for us. Sometimes they do, which is great. And they don't have to you know produce anything specific for the local community but when they do it's fantastic but if they just take this knowledge and go out in the world and you know try to try to make change in culture that's what we want that's that's great and so you said that 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 the Truckee rec center is a good place to see perhaps more of yeah the art. yeah get there in september um it's a yeah it's a fantastic exhibit it really is you'll, you'll learn a lot about forests and fire and you'll see some fantastic artwork by some really great artists. Some of them are, you know, really internationally uh, respected artists. Not just, you know, not just the local school kids who are also part of it. So, yeah. Well, yeah. that and, sounds wonderful. And I, yeah, the I, exhibit also I, includes some outreach programs, including uh, education programs for kids. There was a children's book that was produced and, you know, stuff like that. Wow. Endless, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, uh, I want to say thanks to you two so much and also thanks to our uh, our esteemed Jean Wilson who has worked so hard to uh, to set up the uh, the field trips that we're going to have in the next several days up to Sage Hen Creek so and thanks to Shane who is right now on a plane uh, which is why he's not here this evening uh, mm -hmm. thanks to him for uh, making the connections with you two Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for having so us. Welcome. Goodbye, all.